Виллиан Мернер, лауреат Нобелевской премии по химии, профессор химии прикладной химии Стэнфордского университета, прочтет лекцию «На что способна одна молекула?». Hello. First of all, let me say that I'm very excited to be able to speak to you today at Nauka. It's a great pleasure and honor, and I thank the organizers. I will tell you about a single molecule and how you can use it to see very tiny objects inside cells. This is a story of physics, chemistry, and biology, so we cover many areas of science. Since sizes are important. First, I would like to talk a little bit about the scale of our experiments. One hair on your head is roughly 100 microns down here at this end. And if you think about other structures we want to see, for example, cells, they go down to the 10 micron range. Bacteria, one micron. Here's a virus, 100 nanometers. Here's one protein. Here's a, a small molecule. So all of these scales are of interest to scientists, but notice they span many orders of magnitude. Now, uh, to observe these objects, if you want to look on the very tiniest scales, you can use nuclear magnetic resonance or electron microscopy. But those methods are not suitable for live cells and it's hard to see specific proteins. Light, however, light microscopy is relatively non-invasive and can look uh, at specific biomolecules. However, you only see detail or resolution down to roughly a few hundred nanometers due to something called the diffraction limit. I'll talk about this in some detail and describe it later, but this was a barrier until the advent of something called super resolution microscopy. So I'm going to talk about how we achieve super resolution microscopy with single molecules. But to do that, think back to the mid 1980s and there turned out to be a problem because in the mid 1980s, this great scientist, Erwin Schrodinger, who was one of the great founders of quantum mechanics said, that we never, in a paper in 1952, said we never experiment with just one electron or atom or small molecule. Maybe we do in thought experiments. So that means that the first idea to, to get your mind around is how did we get to the point to wanting to detect a single molecule? Well, I will uh, go back to my early days and in a moment, but that statement uh, by the Nobel laureate gives me my first signpost uh, for the lecture, which is beware when Nobel laureates say something cannot be done. Uh, this is a little bit of a joke. I hope it comes across. We, uh, this is, of course, an invitation for people to prove the Nobel laureate wrong. Well, my early days as a young scientist uh, and my education uh, played importantly in all of this work. So let me just mention uh, I uh, went to science fairs. Here's one where I studied the viscosity of motor oils in the eighth grade. Uh, that's roughly 14 years, 13 years old. Uh, I took things apart. I old television sets, uh, did chemistry experiments in the backyard. Uh, in high school, I became an amateur radio operator. And here's part of my station. I had a lot of fun in those days with science. College. Uh, at Washington University at St. Louis, I started as an electrical engineer, but then got excited about physics and math. So all of these together at that time. In uh, graduate school, I studied physics, but it was actually uh, molecules and the optical properties of molecules. So you can see many aspects of the background build on what I'm gonna talk about next because then I went to my job at IBM Research and the seeds of single molecules started uh, at when I was at IBM Research in San Jose, California. 
The idea is that at that time, we were trying to store bits of digital data in the optical properties of molecules using the color of the laser. This was uh, using a technique called spectral hole burning, uh, where much pioneering work was done by Roman Persanov and uh, Karl Rabani and others. Uh, a lot of beautiful work uh, in the early days on this idea uh, at that time. But uh, this, this project really was one that occurred at a great industrial research lab where we could not only explore new technologies, but also the fundamental science underlying those technologies. And this is something that led to the first single molecules. So there's a little bit of detail here, but don't worry about it. The idea, of course, is to ask and answer a question beyond what is known. At that time, uh, we were interested in molecules like this one called pentacene in the transparent host. Pentacene has an absorption uh, in the orange region of the spectrum. So this is the spectrum of billions of molecules of pentacene. And we were going to store data right up at the top of this spectrum. The question was, is it smooth? Uh, we didn't know because no one had done that experiment. So we did the experiment. And what we found is that it's not smooth, but it's rugged. Uh, and uh, on a broad scale, looks like that. On a small scale, looks like that. And here, I'm really just showing you the color of the laser on the horizontal axis. So uh, we call this statistical fine structure, which was coming from the individuality of the molecules that were in the sample. This is what led to uh, deciding to detect a single molecule. So we achieved that in 1989 uh, with my postdoc Lothar Kador shown here, a single molecule of pentacene has an absorption that looks a bit like this W shape uh, in this spectrum. And it was measured at low temperatures with a special kind of frequency modulation spectroscopy, uh, not too different from your FM or frequency modulated radio, that if you remember those. Uh, a year later, Michel Ori also showed you could detect the absorption of a single molecule by looking at the light that was emitted from the molecule. So this early experiment, which was at low temperatures, started the field. But people wondered, what good is this uh, looking at a single molecule, of course? So, but please note my comment here, even in the industrial research environment, when uh, the exploration of technology includes a passion to explore fundamental basic science, important discoveries can occur. Now, let's think a little bit uh, more about a single molecule, the scale of things. Um, and I wanna just connect you with sort of some physical uh, properties that you may be aware of. Uh, you may think uh, that, let's think of a, an ounce of water or, or about 30 milliliters of water. That contains roughly a one mole, which is about six times 10 to the 23rd water molecules, a very huge number. That's Avogadro's number. One snowflake contains about 10 to the 15th or 10 to the 17th water molecules. So here we're trying to detect one molecule at a time and do which is the same as amount of moles equal to one over Na moles, a very, very, very small number of moles. Well, this uh, strange unit, yoctomole, uh, stands for 10 to the minus 24 moles, but we prefer to call one molecule one guacamole, which is one over avocados number of moles. Now, uh, I apologize uh, for this, but it's, it's a little bit of joke, but uh, hopefully this comes across and uh, you can see that we can have a little fun with science uh, as while, while doing science at the same time. Here is a, a mole from the American Chemical Society and here's the mole dressed up to be a guacamole with some guacamole, it's called. Okay, 
But more seriously, why should we study single molecules? Let me give you a baseball analogy, analogy, but you can think of other sports, for example, football, or soccer, whatever you like. Uh, in 2004, the Boston Red Sox were the champs uh, uh, of the World Series. And here are the uh, team rules, the team batting averages in particular in this column, let's say for Boston or Baltimore. But this is an ensemble measurement, which means it's averaged over all members of the team. But we know that we also have the batting average for each team member. So that if you take that information, you can make a plot like this, which is called a histogram, where you have the number of players versus the batting averages. And you see that uh, this is the same data that produced this batting average for the whole team. So you, so you see most of this, the batters are out here uh, of, on their batting averages, but when you have the full data of all of the individuals, you see something strange down here. What is going on down here? Turns out that's the pitchers. The pitchers know how to throw the ball, but they don't know how to bat it very well, hit it very well. So uh, this shows you what, that you get more information if you can measure all of the individuals rather than just the average. So we translate this idea essentially from baseball to molecules, because then we can ask, are they marching to different drummers or not? Now, how do we do this? How do we do this? So I'm going to give you a little demonstration. We use molecules that are called fluorescent molecules. They interact with light and then give back a different color of light. So this is how that roughly works. Uh, I First of all, I'm drawing these lines which tell you the energies of the molecule. So you start with the molecule unexcited at low energy, but after it absorbs, let's say, green light, uh, called uh, units of which are called a photon, then you can uh, cause a transition from the ground state to the excited state, leaving the molecule in an excited state. That's absorbing light. Now, what happens is that the molecule relaxes a bit, then uh, the molecule will emit uh, a photon back, but the relaxation means the spacing is different between these two levels so that the light emitted is of a longer wavelength or a lower energy. So that's the idea that we're going to use with this demonstration and what we also use with single molecules. So my demonstration uses, first of all, an orange highlighter. So you uh, probably have seen these orange highlighters. Uh, and if you do this, you wanna make sure you get the cheap one, not, not the fancy one. Then uh, I will use a green laser pointer. So here's a green laser pointer. No, it doesn't need high, high power. And I'm going to show you how uh, we achieve uh, uh, pumping of a molecule and having the molecule emit light back. Now let me start with this glass vial that has water in it, just water. You can see there's water in this vial. And now I'm going to shine for the laser uh, through the vial. And what you see here is essentially nothing. The light goes right through the vial. Uh, the water is transparent so you don't see the green light. You may see it up at the top where it's hitting the cap on the vial, but I'm showing you this to make a contrast with what I'm going to do next. I open the vial and I take the orange highlighter and I simply dip it into the water. That's all I've done. I simply dipped the highlighter into the water. And now you look at this vial and what do you see? Basically, you still don't see anything. It still looks transparent. But now let me use the laser to shine light through the vial. And now you will see a beautiful yellow beam of light, orange and yellow beam of light, or maybe it's yellow green. Uh, remember, I'm sending in green light, but I'm getting yellow light back, which is of a longer wavelength. 
it's pretty much like a, a lightsaber, the, the light going through the, the water, because the laser is pumping the molecules that I just put in the water, and the molecules give light back. Even when I hit the wall, notice how the beam bends. You can see it bending there when I hit the wall with a laser beam. So that is a demonstration of fluorescence, and that is critical to our single molecule detection. So what we do in our experiments is just that. We pump molecules from a ground state to an excited state, and after some relaxation, we collect this light that is long wavelength to longer wavelengths. And we may see spots like this on a camera if we look at the light coming from the molecule. But I'm actually going to tell you a little bit more about how it's actually done in a simple diagram. You can see uh, the experiment has its essential elements shown here. There's a laser and you'll watch the green laser reflect and go through a lens and pump the molecule. Then the light from the molecule goes back through the same lens and passes through this object called a beam splitter uh, and uh, goes to a detector. The detector uh, can be a fancy camera of some sort or different kinds of detectors. It can even be your eye. So I want to emphasize that uh, in modern microscopes, you can actually look into the microscope and you will see these tiny dots of light coming from good emitting molecules when there is low background. Because to make this work at the single molecule level, you want to make sure that only one molecule is pumped and that the signal from that molecule dominates over all backgrounds. So that's very similar to what I just showed you with the vial, except now we go down to an extremely low concentration. So in these experiments, illustrated slightly differently now with a blown up scale, uh, you, uh, we're going to send a laser beam through a sample, for example, a cell. And suppose we want to see specific molecules inside a cell, for example, this protein. Okay, I'm showing the video again because I want to point out a few more things uh, of these beautiful dancing single molecules. You see them for a while and then they disappear. That is partly due to photobleaching, a few hundred nanometers uh, related to the size of the cell. And that once again is that special effect called the diffraction limit that I mentioned. Well, once uh, single molecules were open to the community, uh, many surprises began to occur. And one of the more interesting surprises I want to illustrate, certain single molecules, in fact, many will blink. That means turn on and off uh, by themselves without moving. So here's a case where nothing is moving in these movies and we have labeled a protein inside a cell, a bacterial cell. Here's the bacterial cells in white light on the left and on the right is the fluorescence from these same cells. Remember nothing is moving but if you look at the video from the sample you see this spectacular flashing of light. The single molecules are, are blinking on and off this was a surprise when we first uh, saw it in 1997. And this blinking is one of the key elements for super resolution microscopy. So now I would like to uh, move forward and tell you more about super resolution. But first, please note 
we want to remember that when a new regime is explored in science, we cannot easily predict all the surprises that may occur. In fact, some people thought that blinking I just showed you was useless, but it turns out to have applications. The surprises that appear might lead to unexpected and unplanned new things that you can do. So now to set the scale for the cell imaging on a, in a different way, scientists all over the world want to address this grand challenge as, of observing the nanoscale behavior inside living cells or inside complex systems such as polymers. Here's a beautiful drawing by Goodsell of a bacterial cell, which is filled with DNA, RNA, proteins, many, many objects. At, at higher magnification, you see that there are, it's jammed packed with lots of things going on, uh, down to the scale of a few nanometers, tens of nanometers. You'd like to observe all of this with high sensitivity, high specificity, uh, living cells at times, and high spatial resolution. Now, resolution means you want to be able to observe tiny structures and distinguish them from one another. Well, the problem is if you uh, try to focus a visible laser down onto this sample, the smallest spot you can make is still much too large compared to all of these objects of interest. And that's why super resolution is needed. So the Nobel Prize in 2014 was uh, given for the development of super resolved fluorescence microscopy to me and to uh, Eric Betzig and Stefan Hell. So in this type of microscopy, we circumvent, that is we go around that diffraction limit. I'll illustrate it here in a slightly different way. That's a bacterial cell uh, that has been labeled, uh, a, sp a, a specific protein has been labeled and you can't see the structure. You might think all you have to do is to buy the most expensive microscope possible. Here's that most expensive microscope and you still will not see any detail because diffraction makes the individual molecules fundamentally blurry. However, super resolution, remember they, the molecules are only a few nanometers in size, but they appear to be hundreds of nanometers in diameter in the microscope because of the diffraction limit from Ernst Abbe, who recognized this in the late 1800s, uh, which is uh, on the order of a few hundred nanometers. So this is diffraction limited in this picture. Super resolution turns that image into this image. So it's an incredible improvement that with the new techniques, it's easily able to go at least a factor of four or five or even 10 beyond the diffraction limit. A huge improvement in our ability to see the detail inside the sample. How does this really work? So now I'm going to tell you exactly how we do these experiments, the essential ingredients. First, we need to uh, localize or super localize single molecules. By analogy, think of this cinder cone, which is the name for a small mountain inside a volcanic lake. Uh, you know that you can take your cell phone and walk up to the top of this mountain and read off the position or the coordinates of the mountain. That's what we do with single molecules. Here is a single molecule inside a bacterial cell. And now I'm showing the image uh, in a special colored representation where the signal size is shown in the Z direction or Z direction here. Uh, you see that the spot from a single molecule is like a little mountain, uh, which has that diffraction limited width. But what we all we want to do here is just figure out where it is to measure its position. In other words, uh, if I think of it on a camera, that's the same sort of data. All I need to do is to find the center of this image, which you can do mathematically. 
So with mathematics, we can find the position of the center uh, to high precision. The precision improves as one over the square root of the number of photons detected. So that big Abe limit, let's say, of 200 nanometers can be made to be 10 times or even 100 times smaller if we detect 100 photons or 10 to the fourth photons. Well, this idea is not new in science, and it's been around for a long time, and it only works when the molecules are far apart. So we need a second idea to complete super resolution. That second idea is to simply actively control how many molecules are on at a given time. We do this by using molecules and imaging systems where the molecules are sometimes on and sometimes off. That is, even if we shine light on the molecule when it's in the off state, we see no fluorescence uh, versus the other case, we do see emitted fluorescence. So this is key. And you remember that blinking effect I, I showed you allows you to do this along with other methods. To illustrate, suppose we wanted to see this tiny structure. Um, First of all, uh, and, it, and it's uh, uh, many parts of it are smaller than the diffraction limit. First, we label the structure with fluorescent dyes, those black dots. And remember, if we just allow all of them to emit, then each one produces a ball of light and those balls overlap. So this is that fundamental blurriness that I'm talking about from previous microscopy. To solve this, we use an on-off technique and only turn a few on. Then they're spaced apart so we can find their positions to high precision and write them down in the computer. Then we photo bleach them or wait for them to blink. Next time we look at the sample, different molecules will be on because randomly different molecules will participate in this process, which is called a stochastic process. After doing this for a while, we then just show all the positions that we learned uh, from the computer all at once in a representation that's very much like pointillist uh, art. So that has more information than you can get from the previous diffracted limited microscopy. Uh, so uh, that's the key thing that uh, you want to remember from today. But uh, in fact, I, I first want to give you another analogy to help you explain this idea to your family. So think for a moment about fireflies. Hopefully that translates well, and perhaps you've seen fireflies at night in the woods. So now think of the following problem. Suppose I want to observe the branches of a tree. So here's my tree. I want to observe the branches, but it's nighttime. The lights are off. So one way to observe the tree is to place small, tiny, little fireflies all along the branches of the tree, fireflies on all the branches of the tree. Then I just use my camera and take a video. And what will I see? I'll see flash, 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 flash. Uh, and if you simply remember the positions of all the flashes and show them all at once, you will see the branches of the tree. So that's basically what we do. And in fact, um, this gives me another important signpost to remember. Super resolution fluorescence microscopy will give us a new window into the nanoscale because of its ability to see those tiny objects. Uh, it required fundamental scientific advances as well as surprises, blinking and switching. Uh, actually, I want to uh, go back and, and show you one slide that is for some reason uh, not present. Uh, and it is not present for some other reason, so we won't worry about it. But the idea that I want to say is this is what we really do. We make the molecules flash on and off and allow that to show us the, the deeper detail. So here's some examples of new things that have been observed with super resolution microscopy. 
This is an example from an axon, the long structure that extends out from nerve cells. Uh, by labeling a particular protein in axons, these workers uh, in the Zhuang lab saw banding. They saw that the proteins were arranged in lines perpendicular to the long axis of the axon. Here's an example of what's called the synaptonemal complex. When our cells divide uh, before division occurs, the chromosomes become organized around these fascinating, beautiful structures. These are examples of the very, very tiny fibrils or aggregate structures that occur in amyloid diseases. The case here is Huntington's disease. So when someone has a mutant Huntington protein, these structures are made inside nerve cells and especially in the brain. Finally, here's another example. Uh, these, uh, this is actually a cell and what you're seeing is a nucleus up here. And now the surface of the cell turns out to be covered with these tiny little tubules Many cancer cells have these tubules on them. And what has been labeled are the sugars, the sugars in the cell membranes or the glycans, which means we're looking at the glycocalyx, the name of that structure that's produced by sugars on the surface of the cell. All of this detail coming from these tubules would not have been observable without super resolution microscopy. So uh, the number of examples that are available now do from super resolution is well into the hundreds. It's absolutely uh, fascinating that so many new things can be observed this way with super resolution microscopy. And remember, all of this detail came from those blinking single molecules that are decorating the structure of interest. Uh, so, uh, those examples show you that we have now an amazing new window into nanoscale structures five times or even 10 times beyond the diffraction limit or more. Of course, we uh, had, have always got more to do to go even further beyond the diffraction limit. But being able to go from, let's say, 200 uh, down to uh, five times less than that, 40 nanometers, or down to 20 nanometers, you can see from those pictures that so much more can be observed. This leads to a deeper understanding of cell biology. But these ideas can also be applied to catalysis or other physical processes or that occur in materials or other properties of materials. What's actually visible inside a material? It also, these methods may also lead to new strategies to affect pathogenic processes. Uh, that is cells that are not working correctly, uh, as such as amyloid diseases, cancer, and, and many other uh, types of diseases, including uh, viral particles and the way viruses uh, work to attack cells. <clears throat> now, you, you also know that we are living in three dimensions, yet all the pictures I have shown you are two-dimensional. So it is essential to turn these types of images and measurements to, into three-dimensional microscopy. Th this uh, simulation illustrates the problem. Even with a small bacterial cell, uh, if you think of a protein or a structure moving in the membrane of the bacterial cell, it moves in three dimensions. But if I only see a two-dimensional projection of that, then, <coughs> excuse me, you will miss a great deal of detail and make errors. <coughs> so scientists uh, in other laboratories and in my laboratory have developed several methods of producing three-dimensional super-resolved images of cells. Uh, here's an example of bacteria again, 
where the surface of this bacterium has been labeled in white or gray and a specific protein structure inside the cell called uh, crescentin or C-R-E-S, CRES, uh, has been labeled in yellow and orange. So that you can even do this in two colors as well as 3D. Well, what about other cells, cells that are uh, like the cells in our body, mammalian cells? We also can do three-dimensional imaging. Here's an example that uses uh, a technique called the tilted light sheet. And the structure being imaged here is called the nuclear lamina, which is a sac that sits inside the uh, membrane of the nucleus. So you want to imagine the nucleus is inside this sac, uh, and uh, this this is showing a uh, the entire nucleus. In particular, it's also a three-dimensional movie because we have not only X and Y, but also Z that's uh, colored with this color scale. Uh, the X, Y, and Z information shows that nuclear lamina or sac uh, very, very well, uh, including uh, a channel that's running through the nucleus here. Uh, and so the super resolution microscopy technique is now being applied uh, to all types of very small nanoscale structures where we want to see what's going on uh, using light microscopy and its power of being non-invasive. <clears throat> So uh, I want to uh, now mention that the impact of this entire area of science, starting with single molecule detection uh, and spectroscopy and imaging, is impacting many areas of science. Uh, I have listed here some of the impacts on the, the area of chemistry, uh, physics, and biology. Most of my examples today have been biological examples, such as the 3D imaging in bacteria, or here's a two-dimensional image of an axon uh, uh, of a neuronal cell. But let me mention that single molecules can also tell you about small metallic nanoantennas. Uh, single molecules have quantum mechanical properties and emit light that's fundamentally quantum mechanical. Uh, so there's applications uh, to a number of areas of science. And working at this ultimate single molecule limit has attracted the attention of many talented scientists around the world, including in Russia, who continue to make uh, important contributions to this fascinating field. Now what I would like to do is to make a few comments uh, for st the students and uh, everyone uh, who is interested in our future. Uh, you, if you're not a student, uh, you can always become one. I'm a student. I'm still learning even now, uh, but in, in the general sense, what can we take away from all of these kinds of uh, measurements that I've been describing? First of all, let me encourage students to find your passion. It's essential to be passionate about science because science can be hard work. You, you have to be determined. You have to be persistent and you have to be methodical in order to generate valid scientific results. At the same time, it's always important to ask in a deep way how things work. How does this cell phone actually work? Everyone or many people may carry these around, but they do not know about the amazing science that's inside this little box. And uh, so we need to encourage everyone in our society to think about how things work. Why is the sky blue? Why are trees green? And so on, uh, because we need to push beyond conventional wisdom and question assumptions in order to deeply learn how everything works. I want to also encourage you to keep your eyes open for surprises. Now, why do I say this? First of all, my examples uh, of what I've, what's happened in my career show you 
that the surprise of seeing the way single molecules behave, seeing their blinking, uh, can lead to, to new discoveries and new very important applications. The surprises are, of course, a great deal of fun when they occur, when you see them, you're surprised. And why are you surprised? That's because you have to learn first what the fundamentals are already, what is already known, so that you know which things uh, that might appear are not already known. So this is a, a really built on uh, having a, a, an understanding of what's happened before. So scholarly work is clearly very important and careful measurements are, care, are critically important because you want to always rule out if the machine is somehow broken. And that's why you saw this strange behavior. Of course, in science, not everything will work. Not each experiment will work. That is, uh, if you're working at the forefront, some parts of the experiment might fail because you do not, do not know everything about what hasn't been done yet. Uh, on the other hand, failing uh, in that way is a very important learning process. It essentially means that some aspect of what has been assumed is not exactly true and that itself is an important thing to learn to keep moving forward. So don't be unhappy when failures occur, use them as stepping stones to move forward. And why is science so important? Uh, I feel uh, it is because science provides a rational and a predictive way to understand our world. That is, uh, the, the laws that we learn in, in physics, chemistry, and biology uh, allow us to make a prediction about what will happen in an experiment that hasn't been done yet. And then we can go test to see if that actually occurs or not. So the built-in aspect of the scientific method of testing assumptions by experimental data and validating or rejecting new ideas based on experimental data uh, is what makes science so powerful. I, uh, it's also true, I believe, that we actually have no choice but to use science to solve the really big problems of our world. Whether we want to solve the energy problem or the food problem, uh, or suppose you want to build a bridge, you better use science to build the bridge properly or it will fall down. If you want to develop a new drug, you better use chemistry and understanding of biology to guide the development of a new drug. And if you want to send a probe to Pluto and have it arrive exactly where it's supposed to be many years later to take beautiful pictures of Pluto, uh, you need to use science. So we, we have no choice and clearly need to do this for the future. So uh, I want to now acknowledge and thank my past students, postdocs, collaborators, and the current team. Here's a picture of the current team, uh, thanking uh, the agencies that support this work. Uh, we have a no ensemble averaging logo, if you're interested. And we call ourselves this strange name, this guacamole team, because just reminding you, one molecule uh, is one guacamole. Uh, one over avocado's number of moles. So I uh, once again, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that I cannot be there to enjoy the festival in person. I'm sure it would have been very exciting and it is very exciting for those of you that are all there. So in, enjoy every aspect of the uh, festival. Thank you very much. Очень спасибо. William, we have some questions from the live audience. The first question is uh, from uh, Artem Loginov. Dear Professor, how it is possible to determine the position of a single mo molecule during a single blink? A blink means emitting of a single photon, and it cannot be detected by several pixels at the same time. 
So that, that's a very uh, useful question. I'm happy to thank you for that and uh, happy to explain. You want to think of these experiments usually as running with a camera. So the camera has an exposure time, maybe uh, 50 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds. So we actually record photons usually during a time that corresponds to the time the molecule is on. So the, the blinking process that we see is not photon by photon, but the molecule is on for a time when it gives a certain number of photons before going into a dark state. So that's a very important thing to, to clarify, and I really thank you for that question. Uh, when the molecule is in the on state, it will give a certain number of photons out. And then we record th those uh, on, let's say, the averaging time of a camera. Uh, it's important to remember, by the way, that each photon uh, does provide some position information, but the first photon only provides position information corresponding to the whole width uh, of that spot that I've been showing uh, on, on the camera. The more photons you get that you collect during that blink gives you more and more precision in terms of determining where the molecule is. Thank you. And the second question is uh, from Irina. Are uh, electrical and chemical synapses visually different? Electrical and chemical synapses? Is that what's being asked about? Synapses? Uh, yes, uh, that's right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the synapse itself is very much uh, both in a certain way. Uh, that is, th it's electrochemistry. It's molecules that move and that have chemical reactions, but that also uh, carry charges. So the uh, full idea of thinking about nerve transmission, of course, over long distances, we think of the field, okay, the potential uh, that's produced, but the, the potential itself comes from the motion of molecules in and out of the neuronal cell. So it's, uh, you want to think of uh, neurotransmitters as little packages, uh, little small spheres called vesicles that are waiting at the synapse. And when they merge with the synapse and they can move across the gap and therefore there is a charge and potential change as, as a result of those uh, neurotransmitters moving in and out of the cell. So the answer really is uh, it's, it's a wonderful combination of both effects. Thank you. Uh, the third question is, uh, is it possible with this technology to count the number of neurons in different parts of the brain? Uh, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. The, uh, the neurons themselves uh, have a, a wonderfully interesting structure. So let's talk about that for a moment. There's a cell body, which is at the center, and then there's this long axon, which comes out of the cell body. And that long axon can be as long as a meter. Uh, in, in your body, you have some axons that are a meter long uh, that run from the spinal cord down to your foot, for example. So the uh, in the brain, uh, these axons and neuronal cells and connections between them are very, very densely packed. So it is important to figure out how they are connected together. Uh, it is possible to use these methods that I've talked about to find the positions or find the path that different neurons take inside the brain. Uh, some groups, for example, have labeled just one neuron in the whole brain so that that one neuron, and I'm talking now about a fly brain, of course, um, th that one neuron's path can be traced uh, through, through the brain. Um, then another one perhaps has to be labeled and then another one has to be labeled if you wanted to get information about more and more neurons. 
Uh, I want to also say that there is another approach. If you really care about this extremely dense and packed and large, relatively large structure, structure because it's uh, it may be 100 microns um, thick in the uh, in the in the fry fly brain, uh, much thicker in our brains, uh, you would have to do a huge number of super resolution experiments. Uh, well, people have done a huge number of other kinds of experiments to map the connections uh, using a slicing method uh, called focused ion beam milling. You, you take a slice off and then measure where every neuron is and then take another slice off and measure where every neuron is and so on. And, and there's a, a group at Genelia uh, and in other, er other laboratories that are doing these maps of the connections between the neurons in a brain. Thank you. The next question is uh, from uh, Andrei Naumov. <coughs> uh, dear William, nice to see you online and thank you very much for, uh, for the excellent lecture. May I ask your opinion about potential of SMS and uh, nanoscopy in the virology, especially for studying of coronavirus? Okay, well, the, this is a wonderful question uh, from Professor Andrei Naumov, uh, who, who is uh, at the Institute of Spectroscopy in Troitsk and uh, who I've known for a long time. Uh, and the uh, potential of, of these techniques for understanding uh, the virus infection process, uh, I would say, is high. Uh, the idea, of course, is, is as follows. Uh, I showed uh, ways to image detailed nanoscale objects inside cells. And so in this situation, uh, there is a small viral particle which enters the cell and then inside the cell undergoes a complex process of taking over the cell creating new copies of itself, new proteins are made, and so on. And so all of those processes uh, can, can be observed uh, by these kinds of imaging microscopies. They also uh, can be imaged on a live cell. Uh, I showed some live cell imaging earlier, and one can observe the motions of objects inside cells, especially with three-dimensional imaging, to find out where they go uh, another aspect is the RNA. Uh, the, the coronavirus is an RNA virus, and so there are methods to observe RNA. And, and if one were to observe that specific RNA inside a cell, I think uh, much ca could be learned about this process. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, following. Is it possible to introduce fluorescent markers into certain areas, part of the brain, and trace the process of the brain cells? So, okay, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, it is uh, certainly possible to uh, direct the cells, even specific cells, inside a brain to produce fluorescent markers. And that is being done today uh, inside uh, mice brain cells uh, to observe what happens uh, when processes occur, uh, for example, learning processes uh, inside the brain. There is a special field of, uh, of science these days called optogenetics where light is used to even control the behavior of certain cells, to open channels or to close channels, to, to make different uh, uh, responses, neuronal responses uh, occur. Of course, uh, deep inside a, a large brain, uh, that can be difficult to get light deep inside. And so the kind of super resolution I described uh, is very challenging in that sense. However, it's uh, in a fixed brain, a brain that's been fixed, it, it's, it's already possible to remove all of the scattering structures to so-called clear 
make the, make the brain clear so that you can look deep and see only the light from those particular uh, neurons that have been labeled. Uh, so uh, there's exciting progress and progress uh, in uh, these areas. Thank you. And uh, uh, how many molecules of three-stranded DNA are in human cells? Uh, well, the, you know, the, um, so if I think of three-stranded DNA, uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean. That's the, a special structure, not the standard structure. So I do not know how, how many there are or can't ev even estimate that have that strange three-stranded three -stranded structure. So, so let me just say one interesting thing about that question, because it, it, it dives into uh, the amazing behavior of DNA and other uh, important proteins and oligonucleotides, they're called. Um, 